All right, terrific. Welcome everyone to our uh, bonus Q&A session uh, with Dr. Simon Wong. Uh, this is May 30th Q&A session. And um, if you've got questions, please uh, submit them in the chat box. We have, actually we've got some questions uh, from Larry. Larry, you're there and Mariella. And also, actually, Selena's joined us. So, Selena, you there? Oh, yes. Hi. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Perfect. So, let me um, bring up. Selena was the first to submit some questions. So, we'll just go through her. Um, some case studies. And, uh, Selena, do you want to quickly go through this yes so this is a patient of mine um, I've seen a few um, people in the family so we finished some treatment with the cousin and then we're treating him now um, it's funny because he was referred to me because I was treating his cousin and then I point out his um, tongue saw that I noise might need to be removed so and the GP was never mentioned there so uh, I referred him to ENT and then got it removed so mom was happy um, and so they were actually referred to me to check out the tonsils and adenoids. Uh, that, that was funny. So uh, he was class two. He has a open mouth posture. Um, he sleeps a lot at night. And um, we've blocked out the photos, but he had pretty bad like darkness on the eyes and eyebrows and stuff. It looks like he didn't sleep at all. Um, so I find his maxilla is underdeveloped. Um, so we were wearing a plate to develop his maxilla. And I did give them a referral to see an ENT, but for financial reasons, they actually didn't go ahead. And they only want to, they only want to treat him with me. So, so that's what we have right now. So he's been wearing this plate for about three months now. We did expand the maxilla. Um, I think there's comparison to, photos. Do you want me to, uh, Simon, have you had a quick look at this already? Is there any specific questions or what do you want me to? I have questions at the end. Um, okay, you need, uh, can I have the screen? Well, uh, you need, do you have the link? Uh, yes. Okay, so you share them, okay? So which one? It was Tian, right? Okay, that's right. Yeah. Um, it's actually the other one. This one, right, Selena? Yep. Okay, so patient came in, you found that they could breathe through their nose. Yeah. And you were able to do normal dentistry without them um, um, being... He, he was... Yeah, he, he didn't complain at all. He was opening his mouth the whole clean. Yeah. And okay. Yeah, but they didn't decided, talk at all. <laughs> they decided not to do the uh, ENT consult because they thought it was too expensive or... And... Um, but they wanted to go ahead with phase one uh, yeah. consult. Yeah. So obviously we have a child who, uh, when they close, is straining slightly. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can see he's working all his neck muscles to try to close his mouth, uh, mentalis activity. When he smiles, there's a, a frown happening and the lower lip starts to fall down. Um, you can see the way past the vermilion border. So we know there's no control at all. Um, 
that is uh, of any form of refinement. So you, you get a sense that this is a boy who doesn't know how to control his body, and certainly in that facial region. Um, mm -hmm. When he tries to smile, you can see his whole body contorts. All right? So it's not just a smooth action. Uh, his shoulders drop, you know, like he's, he's almost falling down to try to smile. Uh, when we're looking at his profile, we can see he's got a huge convexity to his profile. So his lips are well ahead. Uh, his chin is well back. Uh, we can see he's got enormous buccinators and a forward head posture. Internally, we can see that he's got a deep bite. And he's got a lot of decay history. And how old is he? Eight. Eight. So he's slightly... Um, he's kind of a little bit delayed with his eruption, but not hugely so. Um, and he's missing uh, teeth, uh, probably from extractions because of the decay. Yeah. Um, when you ask him, so this picture is very telling. This is a very important picture. He's on in a perfect class one incisal relationship and his tongue yeah. is, sp is spilling out the sides. Now, whether this when is... When I ask him to bite, that's how he yeah. bites. And yeah. he and shakes back. This, if uh, people who are trying to understand a deep bite, this is their never held position. I, this is a position that they will never, ever hold. This is a position that we get them to hold for the photograph. This is how they rest. All right? Everyone tries yeah. always to rest in a class one position. And if their mouth is open when they do that, their tongue, they've got a huge open bite and their tongue spills out the sides. So this... Mm -hmm is his natural resting position. And his mm -hmm. whole mouth will try to adapt to this position, which is why mm -hmm. he's got a deep bite, but an open mm -hmm. bite. Right? So it's a hidden posterior open bite. So of course, then you get a huge curve of Spey and a huge curve of Wilson. So when mm -hmm. he bite, when you look from the high profile, you can see obviously, um, well, one of the things about taking uh, images, it's very, to try to get uh, yourself uh, at right angles to the premolars. So this is, this is the best way to show how well you've done with your class two correction. Uh, this is the, the little cheats way of showing how well you've done with your class two. If you angle it just right, it looks like you're almost in class one. But the reality is when you come in from the side, uh, it's still a huge class two. And it's really, really important not only to uh, be honest with where we are, but it also gives you a reality check. The reality yeah. check is uh, it, this looks like it's a simpler case than it actually is. When you look at the profile, the true profile, you will, you will realize how big a class two that actually is. And it, it's a deep bite class two as opposed to a class one. Yeah. Um, when we look from the occlusal views, we'll see a couple of things. Um, the, D is lost and the arch is drifted across. Right. So normally what happens is if you lose the E, uh, if you lose the E, the six comes forward, but if you lose the D, um, the anteriors drift back. We can see that the spacing is reasonable up top and um, there's not a huge amount of crowding. You've lost a bit of space because of that. So as far as creating the room that you need for the future, you, you can get this through uh, transverse uh, development and a little bit of sagittal regaining. So as far as an orthodontic component, it's not particularly difficult to make room for the teeth. When we look to see whether we need to do that or not, we have to say, okay, so obviously that's tipped over a little bit and that's closed in. So if you don't do anything, then we're going to run into a spacing issue. So you'd, you'd want to uh, do some early intervention, otherwise you'll run into problems later on. When we look at the OPG, we can also see, you know, how clogged up is the nose, how big is the air space, how much black is there compared to gray. When we look, we want to make sure we don't have any missing teeth. So all the premolars are present, the canines are present. Uh, obviously, he's uh, it's still too early to see whether the eights are present, but um, there we have it. We also get a sense to see how much decay there is, and you know he's got a lot of problems. So one of the problems that we've got to encounter, to decide is where did that uh, pattern come from? And the most common reason is just a dry mouth. Dry mouth is the most common reason for this amount of decay. 
When we look at the uh, lateral ceph, we can see the airway appears to be reasonably clear, but his tongue posture is very low and it doesn't go up into this region, even though he'll claim that his tongue's on his palate. And probably it will be as the tip touches the incisive of papillae, but it, uh, nothing else really touches. And you can see he's got a real, real class two, like a, a significant class two with a divergent growth pattern. All right. So these are some of the most difficult because, not because they're difficult, but because you, most people don't realize how divergent that is and how much of a class two that is. So this is Bimler. Bimler I, I don't know Bimler that well, but you can see uh, vertical growth. All right. So the most important thing to work out is what's this y-axis and you know how far is this a black run. If you're a skier, you'd know what I mean. How much of a black run are we dealing with? And um, when we look, we can see it's a true skeletal class two. It's a deep bite, but um, he's not a division two, um, but he is a vertical. So he's got the um, a divergence starting to happen. Now, deep bites are slightly easier to deal with than open bites, of course but they never look good if you don't rectify the vertical growth, right? They just look like they're, these ones always end up looking like they're bimaxillary protrusive. Um, I don't know much about this uh, appliance, but you've done some stuff to try to open up space. So you, at the, this is, uh, I'm trying to figure out, what's your logic behind using this? Well, because um, it's a I, I was, Yeah, I was trying it out because with Steve Galera system, this is his only uh, phase one appliance. Yeah, but why are you trying it out? What's your rationale to use a sagittal appliance in the upper arch? So let's um, pretend I'm the orthodontist on the board <laughs> who's, who's um, you know, have you on a hearing and, and trying to figure out why are you using a sagittal appliance on an upper? Uh, if we go back to finger analysis, his mm -hmm. um, maxilla is short and behind. Yeah. Yeah, but how are you going to make the mandible catch up in a class two if you push the class two even worse? We were supposed to adjust the ramp, the acrylic on this plate, and that will guide the mandible forward. All right. Um, do you find that that happens, like historically? Have you been able to do that? It happened in the first month, because um, the first month I put it in, he actually bites back, and then I see him a month later, he came uh -huh. in, he actually bites forward. Yeah. Um, so what, but what I think he was more onto the exercises at first, and then we kind of losing that after, and then his mandible starts to shift back again. Okay, so one of the things we find with deep bites, not so much in division one deep bites, but in division two deep bites, the ma the mandible is jammed back whenever he bites, but he's a division one deep bite. So they don't really move back. All right, so so the understanding the difference between a division one and a division two gives you an understanding of when you might use something like this. All right, mum's complaining the teeth looks more protrusive. Well, if you use a sagittal on a division one, guess what? It looks more protrusive. So the question is, um, mums complain when they don't know that it's going to happen. And mm -hmm. Asian mums hate by maxillary protrusive looks, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that we have to determine is if they're not a division two, which works well by proclining the incisors, but they're in fact a higher angle uh, division one class two of some significance, then anything you do increases vertical and anything you do to push the uppers forward makes them look infinitely worse. So patients have been doing some uh, myotherapy Open mouth posture a day, obviously observe. So they've, you've been trying to mechanically tape the lips together, but he rips it off. Yeah, at night. So, yeah, at night. 
Um, and he's still got his mouth open during the day. So effectively, it's not possible to um, create a change at night when the day hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. Chris just made a comment. I just he brought up that he feels that it is a he thinks it's a div one division one. Yeah, it is a division. Oh, so it's a division two, and the premix is down and back. And well, yes, yeah, it's down and back, but the incisor is in a fairly normal position, if not slightly uh, forward. Right, so the whole complex is down and back, but the dental division, see division one and division two applies to the incisal, uh, the dental component, right? The skeletal component is the classification, and then the dental component is the division, and these are not retroclined teeth. He's saying that there's a pre-maxillary vertical excess, and he's asking what is yeah. the indicator line? The what? The indicator line. Chris, do you want to unmute and just want to hash it out? I mean, it's always good to, if you want to put your reasoning behind your thoughts. Chris? Okay, anyway, uh, let's, let's just keep moving to try and get a solution. So when you put the appliance in, you effectively have him in a bite that he normally holds, yes? Because this is his yeah. start position. So now what you've done is you've filled in where his tongue normally lives, a big block of acrylic. Yeah, so no, his tongue normally lives there, but now you've got a block of acrylic. So what that tends to do is it tends to make the child hang their mouth open even more. Because okay. um, this was the position that they habitually hold, but they can't hold this position anymore because there's a block of plastic where their tongue exactly. is. Exactly. Exactly. So, so can you uh, hear me now or not? Chris? Oh, hi, yeah. Chris. Yeah, hi, how are you going? Um, well, I'm just interested what, he's in, what the patient's indicator line is, and I would have thought it was um, longer than ideal. Yes. And therefore, my, my process would have been to intrude the upper anteriors or to bring the premaxilla forward and up yes and, and that's for me what the sagittal is, is helping doing well the sagittal drives it in the direction it's going which is down and forward the the occlusal yeah. plane is certainly down i agree yeah but so then if you, all you do is open up, if all you do is open up a screw in a sagittal plane all it does is it keeps driving in the direction that it was heading right so if we look at this, can we look at the Ceph one more second and just see? So, so yeah, certainly, it's certainly going this way. If you, put yep. a, if you put a screw there, all it does is it keeps driving it in the direction. But because you've also got eruption going on, because he's got his mouth open, it will go forward and down. Okay. So it will effectively so keep going in the direction that it's heading because there's no reason for it not to. In fact, there's a greater reason for it to be falling down and back because now where his tongue, see, this is where his tongue used to live at rest, yeah? Yep. So that was his natural resting position. And people don't see that, but that's actually how uh, these deep bites rest. And then now with the appliance in place, uh, he can't rest there because his tongue now has nowhere to live because the plate is where his tongue used to live. So what does he do? He hangs his mouth open even more. Okay, I see, I see you thinking. So yes, I would have probably intruded the upper anteriors and not taken yes. up the tongue space if I could have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one of the beauties about the stage one appliance where there's no acrylic in that upper region and you can intrude the wires to try to achieve what you hope. See, what Chris brought up is what we would want to do and then we have to make a decision. Can, do do can that do what we want it to do? And right. it only does some of the things that we would like, but it doesn't do the main thing that we would like because I agree. Uh, that's what you get. I like your explanation. So, yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I so think all of a sudden, I wanted to yeah, all of a sudden, go look, forward. Yeah. It looks worse, doesn't it? Well, yeah. And like it, you, get more, you get more, but more of what you didn't want more often than not. And that's the trouble with how Galella thinks. Hmm. 
Um, you know, I, I don't know his system, his current system well enough. I, I did learn some of his older systems about 10 years ago. But, uh, you know, this is just how I think things through about what, what works, what doesn't work, why it works, why it doesn't work. That's cool. So um, here we are now, and you've made a lot more room, but his overjet is worse. Yes. And then, and then, which is fantastic if you have a means of developing the lower jaw, but because they're still on the same trajectory, it's very, very hard to change that, especially when the root cause of the problem was hanging the mouth open, and then you put a block of plastic that makes it worse with um, no way of counteracting it because he's not a strong muscle tone boy. All right. So if he was a true division two, he would have a lot of strength and you could overcome it, which is why almost every of every one of these systems works really well for division two class two malocclusions, right? Not the severe ones, but for the moderate ones and the mild ones, it works really, really well. So it's, it's a useful tool for the right classification, but for this classification, all it does is makes it worse. Um, so um, what it ends up looking like is you'll get more teeth in, um, but it will look more uh, bimax protrusive. And then they'll complain. And then the orthodontist will say, well, you should have taken out the two first premolars anyway. So that's what you get for mucking around with someone who's not a specialist. And then I'm going to have to charge you twice as much to correct their problem. So you should sue them. All right. So that's actually the conversation that goes on in the other office. You know that, right? Um, now, uh, well, the, the problem that you have is, um, what way do you have of, see, we, there's lots of stuff that we can do to correct the transverse deficiency. And there are things that you can do to reduce the deep bite. Right? So a stage one appliance will do that. The problem that you have is how can you control the vertical? The exercises, see the GOPEX exercises alone. Why do I tell people only do the simpler cases? GOPEX exercises will hold vertical from increasing dramatically. It won't correct the vertical growth pattern, but it'll hold it from getting worse dramatically. But it will not look any better. It just won't look any worse if it's done well. So you've got to have a system in a vertical grower to reduce vertical. And that's a really, really difficult thing to do. And if you start cases like this, they just always look worse. So um, you've see the thing is at the moment, how would you manage this where you are now? Well, you, you're in a reasonable place. Start working on the exercises. Um, you have to, you have to help mum understand that there is a vertical growth pattern that will continue to worsen. And so long as they know that, then they're okay. But if we give them the wrong impression, then they'll get upset. Now, how would I have, how would I correct this? I would do what I normally do, which is buy block orthotropics, but um, it, that's, you know, for skeletal, significant skeletal malocclusions with a uh, vertical component that's excessive. And these are really difficult cases. So this is not a case that I would say uh, that you could use other methods and be very happy with the results. Because I've used, uh, you know, in cases like this, I've done, I've done treatment like this. And uh, the results are really mediocre. Um, uh, Gary has a yeah. Has keep reading. I, I've forgotten. Okay, so this is what they look like when you're done with expansion and my functional therapy. Okay. This is the result. It's these types of cases. 
you know, you can make lots of room and it looks fantastic and you've, you know, saved the teeth from being extracted. But you go from here to here. All right, so basically what it ends up looking like, you have all the teeth in, but they look like a monkey. So that's what it looks like when you're done. And the teeth, you know, you can get them all in. It's not a problem. Well, but that's this is what these are what those children look like at the end. All right, you've you'll you'll do stuff. You'll get the teeth nice, but the path of the growth doesn't change. Your goal is just not to let it get horrendously worse. But the question is, if you don't prepare the parents to know that this is the outcome with these methods, they won't be happy. All right, so this is just like your boy. A lot of Asians are like this and they grow straight down. What GOPEX does is it stops them from growing back. It doesn't stop them from, it doesn't make them grow forward they grow straight down instead of down and back. All right, so that's, that's the best you can do with um, this type of treatment that, that I've been teaching you and the type of treatment that we see across the board um, for all functional type treatments. But you know, if you've, ex if you've given them that expectation, then uh, they're okay. But if you haven't, that's the best you can get. So that's why I've, I stopped doing this type of treatment for children who are divergent. And I just offer the more advanced treatment because I know I'm not happy with this. Anyone can achieve this. I mean, for us uneducated parents, we've got no idea that, you know, as long as his teeth look great, we, I can't tell whether the jaw is grown correctly or not. You know, I just think that's... Yeah. You know, and um, that's, uh, you know, that's, as, as I said, you can use, uh, you're, you're, on, you're on the right track to achieve that. But if you want more than that, um, and you've pro if you've promised more than that, that's the problem. So, Selena, is that, okay, uh, any other questions on this? Otherwise, we better move on to the next case. Yeah, you... yeah, let's go to the next one. <laughs> So Terry actually had a question that might be relevant. I don't know. Do you think Galela's appliance was trying to crystallize the upper sixes to to um, Clark? So he was looking at teeth, and not the whole. Thing? Yeah, I, I don't know, but um, each appliance has a specific design, and that particular appliance was trying to distalize the posterior segment, but also uh, advance the yeah, anterior segment. So, and then jack the bite open as well because it had a big bite ramp. So what, what the intention is versus what actually occurs um, sometimes is different. What the appliance tells me is he's trying to push the back ones back, the front ones forward, and jack the bite open, which is what most people tend to do in a deep bite division too, right? They want to jack the bite open to open up, to reduce the deep bite. They want to push the molars back so that they can retract, so that they can bring back the premolars and the canines and the incisors and reduce the class two. So that appliance is designed specifically for that goal. Uh, and if that's your goal, then you'll probably get it. Well, I think I think the appliance I think the appliance is designed with that specific goal in mind to distalize the back teeth and to jack the bite open. And that's kind of what's happening. Okay, terrific. Let's move on to Archer T, age nine. So Archer is nine and we're using um, full Schwartz appliance, upper and lower. So we're expanding.
Any quick comments, Selena? Um, I think I've written like during the slices my thoughts okay. and my so, questions. Current problem. <laughs> so, hang on. Wait, 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 wait. so currently expanding and not wearing it while eating and not wearing it while doing uh, myofunctional therapy. So we've got plates that uh, right, that sit over the entire anterior occlusal surface. And so, of course, when we bite, we are only going to touch this area here, right? Yeah. Because you've set up a bite ramp so that only the anteriors touch. Posterior open bite without the plates, upper screw starting to wind back upper space created between the incisors. Are they drifting back by leaning class three now? Low incisors still crowded with gaps in between. Um, so when you look at this carefully, it's not an open bite. You've just got the, you've just got the plunger cusps, right? So it's not a posterior open bite. You've got the palatal cusp of the uppers plunging down because the upper molars are tipping out so that you've got super eruption uh, that way. So you've lost torque control. All right, you've tipped mm -hmm. and plunger cusp down so that when he bites, he's riding his palatal cusp against the buccal cusp. All right? Palatal cusp of the uppers against the buccal cusp of the lowers. The lowers are, mm -hmm. are um, so engaging, um, you know, so, they're, so it's jacking up the bite. Um, the anteriors are still, well, the, the lower incisors are coming forward. You can see they're tipping forward. But of course, it's still crowded because you've got uh, a plate that's locked them into the position that you began with. So okay. this is a plate that's holding the teeth exactly where they began. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So appliances are, are not particularly smart but they're very loyal. They try to do exactly what you want them to do. The question is, have you asked them to do what's best? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty much doing exactly what it can do. Um, the question, see, when he bites, you can see that's not an open bite. It's got full contact. It's just that, it's not the contact you want. So when we look to see, he's got good spacing and you've developed things well, and there's enough room for everything to fit. If you want things to align, you can either, uh, you know, the lower arch is quite nice. You can see that the curve of Wilson and the curve of Spay is much better controlled. So the lower arch is, a, is good. You've just got these plunging down the way you don't want them to. And you've got to determine whether it's just the E's or whether it's the sixes as well. All right, which we can't see because you, you haven't got the image far back enough. If it's just the E's, you're a restorative dentist, take your burr out and grind it down and your bite will close. If it's your sixes, you can't do that. So you've got to get him to chew like there's no tomorrow until he uh, gains torque in those uh, molars again. Uh, as far as the getting these lined up, well, you can, you can either give him a retainer with no screw and muck around with the wires, or you can just strap up these teeth at the front and they'll be straight in a couple of months. So you just put your brackets on the D, the C, the two, the one, the one, the two, the C, the D, and in a couple of months, they'll be perfectly straight and retracted back again and again. So one option would be uh, fi finish up with what you've done with all the bits of plastic that you got in the mouth, strap those front teeth up and they'll come back in and align. Uh, take a burr and grind the crap out of the palatal cusp of the E's and get him to chew like there's no tomorrow on the molars. And then the sixes will... Um, intrude and it'll look nice.
Will the in the other insiders um will the space close between the other insiders naturally um when the series erupt? Because yes. Um, okay. Yeah, because you don't have enough room here for your canine. So if no. you want, you can strap those up and then yeah, change. Yeah, I, I didn't create the space for the canine. I created space between the insiders. <laughs> yeah, so you can strap it up, C2, 1, 1, 2, C, and then chain 2 to 2. And they'll close up and the space will open up here and then you're done. And that's the end okay. of phase one. Okay. So that will work well, assuming that uh, you're willing to give up your SWATS appliances. Um, it won't change the skeletal relationship, but you'll you'll be able to do that. And that works because he's a horizontal grower, right? So you can do all sorts of stuff with horizontal growers, and then you can, you know, tidy up what you don't like fairly easily because growth is working for you. So, you know, it, you can use all sorts of nice things or, or not so nice things and you'll still get an okay finish if you're able to tidy it up, which it's not hard to do in a horizontal grower. So that was, a, you know, that's a, it's a good case to finish off. Well, he's not class three. Yeah, so he's just protruding forward because of the plunger cuffs. Yeah, he could be sliding forward because of the uh, premature contact. Um, you've also pushed his incisors forward a long way. So you'll bring them back when you um, strap them up. Okay. So this, he's, got a fun he's just drifting forward functional, isn't he? He's got nowhere else to go. Okay. It's very hard to turn someone to a class three. Okay. You know, so, uh, so that's a good one. Okay. Thank you, Simon. Okay. Thanks, Selena. Have a good day. You too. Thank you. I'll listen to the rest of the recordings. <laughs> Thank you guys. Yeah. Bye-bye. All right. Mariella. I have a question that Simon can uh, quickly um so we went through the bolton overlay um at one of the earlier q a times as well as the we spent a fair bit of time in the phase one um, already so what we'll do is um i'll revisit the case that I never got to finish, the other twin. And uh, I'll go through it again quickly. So this was the other twin. We spent time working up the, uh, the brother. Uh, these are fraternal twins. Um, so he presents differently because he's not uh, he's a class two, but he's not a vertical grower like his brother. Well, not as severe a vertical grower. And um, we can see that he's obviously got a very weak chin, but he's not long like his brother was. And then we've overlapped the Bolton skeletal tracing and the Bolton profile tracing. And then um, we can see that... Um, He's still a divergent case, but not as severe like his brother. So when we look at his analysis, we can see that um, his y-axis is within the normal range, but he's you know a six and a half degree uh, class two, so he's a surgical case normally. All right, so how did we overlap that? So 
So um, the profiles come like this. You just pick the one that's suitable for the seven-year-old. You, you grab the corner and drag it around. You move it over. And it's important to grab the corner and not the middle dots. So you grab the corner. I always pick the bottom right corner. And I just resize it. If you pick these ones, it distorts it. So never pick the middle ones. Always pick the corner ones. You get it roughly the size you think it is, then you move it around until it overlaps. Get the forehead in line, and then play around with the dimension, and then you can rotate a little bit, and then you can use the fine control to move it back, and that's basically how you do that. So that's how you do the um, tracing. Okay. And then um, you can, you just get an estimate on the lip size. So it's somewhere in between the two, like so. And then, this one here is the same. You resize it. You just grab it from that PowerPoint Bolton uh, template that I gave you guys. Grab it. You line it up. Let's say it's you know on an angle when you first get it. You line it up. You get it roughly the size. So I usually um, reference Sella and Nazion. So I keep opening it up until I'll overlap that. I'll rotate it. I'll enlarge it. And then I'll move it around until the forehead. So the frontal bone, nasal bone, and cellar is what I'm trying to overlap as accurately as possible. And that's it. And then, uh, so that's it. Uh, it gives you a, a snapshot, a thumbnail sketch, like the artist would say, a thumbnail sketch. And while we're here, so that is the brother. So his issue is class two, although he has a level of divergence, it's different to uh, the first twin that we did, uh, we spent the time on previously. All right, who's hyperdivergent. All right, so you'll see not only is he down, and not only is he back, but he's down. All right, you can see his jaw is just basically completely distorted. And then not only does he have the same level of class two, but all of a sudden he's hyperdivergent. So uh, what does that all mean? It means that when they present at this age, they look about the same dentally, right? So the other one had a slight deep bite. This one has a slight open bite. You think, oh yeah, that's, the, that's cool. It's not that hard to fix. And dentally, it's not that hard to fix. The, the issue is what you do for this boy won't work in the same way as what you do for his brother. this boy. It's the same family. They're twins. I mean, they're fraternal twins. They're not uh, identical twins, but you can do stuff with this boy and get away with it. And anything you do, including just breathing on this boy will get him to grow more vertically. So um, the, 
how you would present to this boy's parent would be completely different to how you would present to this boy's parents. Now, the fact that they happen to be the same parents kind of muddies the water if you don't know what or how to plan this. And I, uh, I presented the case um, the day after we finished our course. And I did it slightly differently to how I presented it to you guys because I realized one thing. When I first started, I would have to present by preaching. Right? I would have to explain everything, which is what we did with you guys. But with more experience and with more cases, now I present by showing off, showing off what I can do for children who have the similar type of growth patterns. So there's a lot less talking and there's a lot more showing. So before when I first started, it was tell and pray. And now it's show and tell. Now I can do show and tell because I can bring up, you know, I can, I can open up my uh, folder and I say, Hmm, let's see which one is like your boy. And I'll pick five of them just like your boy and show you what I've done. So I don't have to talk as much. I can just show, but with you guys, you have to tell because you got nothing to show. So if you have cases that are similar but, and you've been successful, by all means, show them because that's important. But if you don't, then you have to stick to the cases that you know you can do rather, rather than the ones you can't because you're not going to achieve the result. Or you have to say, I've never done this before, um, but I'm happy to give it a go. And you have to be honest. Or you have to pick families who really, really trust you, who love you, who believe in you, who you've looked after for a very long time. And you say, we're just going to give it a go and see what happens. All right. Uh, Larry is the next. Hello, Larry. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello, Larry. So uh, you've got some questions, so let's read through this. Uh, your explanation on the effects of early spoon feeding and the correct sequence of eating maturity, liquids, solids, and puree really helped to shed light on the genesis of abnormal swallowing in children. Can you describe, explain further how a child's tongue swallowing movements transition correctly from breastfeeding to proper swallowing? Um, the, the development of an infant into a child and the transition in their swallowing occurs uh, neurophysiologically. So what happens is when we are about, I think it's 24, 20, 18 to 24 weeks uh, gestation, we develop uh, the uh, swallow reflex. So we, we already know how to swallow in uh, the womb. And when we are born, we have the capacity to suckle. And suckling is uh, usage of uh, lip, buckle, um, cheek, fat pads, mm -hmm. and an anatomically enormous tongue in a tiny mouth. So, in a newborn, they have a development where their tongue fills the entire oral cavity, like the whole cavity. There's no space anywhere for anything other than the tongue. Right? There's no teeth, nothing but tongue. And the soft palate and the epiglottis are in what they call lockup. So, the yeah. soft palate touches the epiglottis yep. and there's effectively no neck or there's a teeny tiny space of the neck. And so um, the only movement anatomically the tongue can do is come back and forth. The, it's got no room to do anything but that. So it can come forward and it can come back and it doesn't leave the mouth. 
the tongue does not encroach on the pharynx at all because the soft palate and the epiglottis touch. So you, it's anatomically primed for suckling. Suckling, yeah? So that's breastfeeding. Now, at around six months, that natural back and forth movement starts to wane. It starts to wind down and disappear as the anatomy of the child starts to change. The anatomy changes in that there's a lot more growth. The mandible starts to grow much bigger because every baby is born a severe class two. <laughs> every baby is a severe class two at birth. There's no, there's no such thing as a class three baby. No mother would appreciate birthing a class three baby. <laughs> so um, what happens is the mandible grows a lot. And the transition from the epiglottis and the, uh, the soft palate and the, lar the larynx and the epiglottis starts to drop away. It drops away from the uh, soft palate as the neck elongates and uh, we start the separation of the mouth. We, we stop the separation of the mouth and the throat and we start to blend it together. So as the soft palate starts to pull away from the epiglottis, the tongue can start to fall back into the uh, back of the throat. And that primes us in preparation for swallowing and speech. Most importantly, it's priming us for speech, which occurs at around one year of age. It's also timed with the eruption of teeth. So teeth come at about six months or thereabouts. And between 12 months and 18 months to 20 months, you get the rest of the teeth coming through the molars and stuff. So what happens is... Um, as teeth come through, as the anatomy changes, as the soft palate and epiglottis move away, you start to get the ability for the tongue to start to move up and down and left and right. Mm. So the definition of a swallow, no, a definition of a suckle is when the tongue goes back and forth with the lips and the cheek pad squeezing. Mm. At six months to 12 months, the buckle cheek pads start to uh, disappear. Mm -hmm. uh, you get the anatomical change, which occurs to, at around 12 months, which is when kids start to learn how to talk. Mm -hmm. And you get more volume intraorally for the tongue. And the tongue can start to go left and right and up and down. And a mm -hmm. suck is upward movement, right? So when you suck, your tongue goes up. When you suck on a straw, your tongue goes up and squeezes up. So when you start to move your tongue up and down, as opposed to just back and forth, then you begin the true transition to a suck. And the swallow is, is when you have complete separation of the epiglottis with the uh, soft palate, and then you get an automatic reflex where the vagus nerve kicks in and you get the um, swallow uh, process going on. And that is timed with the anatomical changes. But the easiest way for people to differentiate when the right timing is to just look at the teeth. What teeth are present? When all the molars are out, it's time to be uh, swallowing uh, the, and, in an adult form. Before that, you're still transitioning from suckling to sucking to... So that's, that's how it happens. Um, are there different types of abnormal swallowing? Uh, yes. Um, I, I don't know enough about dysphagia to tell you. Uh, that's a very specific um, specialty. Speech lingual pathologists are into that. And there are lots of abnormal swallowing patterns, absolutely. Um, the children I deal with um, have swallowing patterns that are a deviation off normal, but are not considered by pathologists to be abnormal. Um, and there's a whole range of uh, different abnormals. And, you know, a lot of syndromic children uh, are the ones that they deal with there in that regards. Um, I, I don't know enough about it. I've got lots of, I mean, over the years I've learned lots about it. So this is, uh, 
this is my swallowing reference library. So, you know, there's lots, you can, there's lots, there's lots of different uh, ways of understanding. Um, there, there are hospitals that have released um, hand, handbooks to help clinicians um, kind of grasp how to clinically evaluate, um, how to differentiate the timings, uh, what to look for, when to refer, uh, different, you know, it's a whole a huge specialty field for generally um, uh, very troubled, very sickly uh, infants. Mm. And then, uh, of course, there's uh, different references. Um, uh, uh, pediatric dysphagia is a huge, huge topic. Mm. Um yeah, if you have a tongue tie, uh, with these habitual low tongue with lip seal, open mouth posture, what it does with that is it alters normal swallow to be less than ideal, which is different from an abnormal swallow. So we're dealing with children who have a normal swallow pattern, but are less than ideal because of bad posture. We're not dealing with uh, children who are classified as dysphagic. Mm -hmm. uh, are there three? Are these three abnormal swallowing, tongue thrust swallow, infantile swallow the same thing? So no, abnormal swallow or dysphagia is a pathology, usually brought on by uh, a syndromic child or a child that's been deprived of oxygen or traumatized or something like that. Yeah. And then a tongue thrust swallow and infantile swallow are very similar in that an infantile swallow, as I explained, is anatomically, it's just back and forth. Uh, tongue thrust swallow is anatomically, you have the capacity for up and down, but you're still doing back and forth. Yeah. In the recent advanced session, there was one case where the anterior cross bite edge to edge was managed with forehead pull. In what cases of anterior cross bite that can terrorize can be used in step forward? Well, I, I just make that decision based on whether it's a, a, a skeletal class three or whether it's a skeletal class one with a dental class three. Mm, okay. Yeah. So forward head pull is great for a skeletal. Um, pushing the teeth is really good for a dental problem. In simpler cases, uh, if the upper arch has been expanded to about 38 millimeters and later the lower arch curve of Wilson and Spey is flattened with the lower appliance, would the upper and lower arch teeth be meshed, married well with postural training? Um, in a skeletal class one, absolutely. So what we're talking about here is understanding um, a skeletal problem and a dental problem. So when you create a, a mild change in the skeletal relationship, you get a mild change in the skeletal relationship. So expanding the upper to 38 mils, uh, ex, uh, uh, you know, and in uprighting the lower teeth until you've got a, all you're doing here, see what this process is level and aligning. Yeah. We're level and aligning in early intervention. Now, when you level and align in a class one case, does it all fall into place, Larry, after you've leveled and aligned? Yeah. If you level and align in a class two or class three case, you finish part one and you're ready for mechanics now, aren't you? So this is all that we're doing. We're level and aligning the arches. But because we're younger, we do, we're making some skeletal improvements. And if we do use posture, that's when we use GoPex and GoFex and silicon chewies, we're just using mechanics. So what can you do in mechanics normally with elastics, with Jasper jumpers, with, uh, um, you know, with um, all the things that we normally do, twin block, whatever it is. We can get about four mils, can't we, of dental compensation. 
So that's a good rule of thumb to work with as well with GoPex and with um, stage one appliances. You're going to level on a line and you might get about four mils of uh, improvement, maybe four mils of skeletal improvement, maybe a mixture of skeletal improvement and dental improvement, um, depending on whether they're older or younger. So I would say, uh, as a general rule, if you follow the general rules of orthodontics, um, you'll get about the same change, but you might get, instead of four mils of dental and no skeletal, you might get four mils of skeletal and uh, uh, no dental. Or you might get two mils of skeletal and two mils of dental, or something along those lines. But if you, if you kind of bracket for about four mil improvement, then you get a lot, then you about ballpark. <laughs> but you might have to like what we did with Selena's case take the burr out and grind the cusps of the uh, primary teeth to help uh, you might have to grind in particular the cusp of the primary canines mm -hmm. to stop it from being locked back or forward mm -hmm. uh, Muhammad has a question Hello, Muhammad. Is Muhammad there? Yes, hello. Hi, Simon. How are you? Hello, Muhammad. So your question is, how long do we need to keep the Hoffman wire appliance in order to maintain the results? Um, it's a very hard habit to break. That um, mentalis and lip uh, activity. So the longer you keep it in, the better. Um, the Easiest way to determine is this. You take the appliances out and you say, smile, please. And if they have a relaxed, open mouth smile, you're done. If they do this, your Hoffman wire really needs to stay on, doesn't it? So you can check, you can, you can gauge it. Um, you can see whether the teeth are still reclining back or whether they're staying forward. So it takes as long as it takes to change the habit. Mm. Some kids is really quick, others it takes, you think you can never break it. They'll live with the ulcer rather than change their habit. 